tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can't. We've been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave, sister was a slave, father was a slave. They know enough about reading right that all that I know they teach you to mind your master and your missus. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after she was broke, just turned, just like he turned some out, you know. Didn't know where to go. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Third people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. He want to slip on the floor. Had it here and had it there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't. We didn't know nothing. Didn't like it looking no book. Harriet Smith, remembering what she saw as a small girl during the final days of the Civil War. We said, oh, I stood on that picket fence all day long, seeing them soldiers going back to silent zone in different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers in Joe. Mm -hmm. That's right long. Of well. course, I remember all our white folk and all the names of them, all the children. Called every one of the children's names. Who, who did you belong to? Jim Bunton, the baby boy. The results of these digitally enhanced recordings are arresting, almost unbelievable. The idea of hearing the voices of actual slaves from the plantations of the Old South is as powerful, as startling really, as if you could hear Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee speak. Listen again to Fountain Hughes, who was born in 1848. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that, have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Here is 91-year-old Texan Laura Smalley talking in the 1940s about the outcome of a tussle between two women, one black, one white, one slave, one mistress. The mistress tried to slap the slave, but the black woman pushed her into a chair. Laura Smalley was a girl at the time, but she remembers vividly what happened to the black woman when the master came home. Well, they take that old woman, poor old woman, cat in the peach orchard, and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well, looked like to me, I can't. And around the tree, and whipped her. And well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it, it just had her clothes all down to her waist, you know. It didn't have her plumb naked, but they had her clothes down to her waist. And every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. Snuff the pipe out on her. You know, the embers in the pipe, on where you ever see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on Mm-hmm. Good Lord, mm -hmm. man. The plantation on which Smalley was a slave sounds brutal. She recalls scrambling with other children for food from a huge wooden tray, like a hog trough. All of them, you know, would get around that tray with spoons and eat city like mush or soup or something like that. And all of them children get around there and just eat, 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 eat. Fountain Hughes tells his interviewer about the relentless round of work for him on a Virginia plantation. The night never come without you had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they want you to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. And if they want you to hang all night long, you hang, hang the back. It didn't matter about your tired being tired, you're afraid to say you're tired. It was cotton, not tobacco, that solidified slavery, though. The invention of the cotton gin at the end of the 18th century made its processing easy, but the crop still needed enormous amounts of unskilled labor. Control of the slave and his labor through laws and regulations became paramount. Fountain Hughes talks about one of those controls, the pass system. Now, I couldn't go from here across the street well, I couldn't go to nobody's house without I have a note. 
for something from my master. And if I had that pass, I was what we call a pass. If I had that pass, I could go wherever he sent me, and I'd have to be back. You know, when I, whoever he sent me to, they, they'd give me another pass, and I'd bring that back, so it's a show how long. Even emancipation didn't truly free the slaves. Freedom freed slaves for more travail. The end of the Civil War found many cast adrift without skills and no place to go. And the Yankees who freed them weren't always seen as benevolent liberators. I remember when the Yankees came along and took all the good horses and took all the, sort of all the meat and flour and sugar and stuff out in the river and let it go down the river. And they know the people who wouldn't have nothing to live on, but they done that. The ex-slaves left one hell for another, perhaps an even more dangerous one. No longer property, they didn't have the protections afforded property. When we were slaves, we couldn't do that, see? Mm -hmm. And if we got free, we didn't know nothing to do. And my mother, she then she hunted places and bound us out for a dollar a month. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing. We didn't have nothing on it, just to, like the cattle, we were just turned out and uh, get along the best you I don't hide the other side of the folks, you know, freedom. We didn't know. They just thought, you know, we're just feeding us, you know. They didn't, they didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned, just like he turned some out, you know. They didn't know where to go. But this where they stayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't know where to go. In the narratives, the slaves used an interesting phrase for the end of slavery. They say, when the break came. Good times, easy times, were not at hand. The trials for millions of black Americans didn't end in 1865. They continued. Laura Smalley and her family became sharecroppers. Harriet Smith's first husband was killed by whites during the Reconstruction, probably because of his political organizing. Fountain Hughes went north to Baltimore and worked at numerous jobs, including hauling manure. Not an enviable job, but it was the job of a free man. 